It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Queen's University Belfast annual Senator George J. Mitchell Peace Lecture for 2020. Our lecture today will be hosted by the distinguished journalist and QUB honorary graduate, William Crawley, and it's been organized by the public engagement team at Queen's on behalf of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. I'm Richard English, Pro Vice Chancellor for Internationalization and Engagement here at Queen's, and it's a privilege today to introduce our distinguished lecturer. Pumla Gobodo Medikizela is Professor in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Stellenbosch University. She holds the South African National Research Foundation Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma. Professor Gobodo Medikizela has published extensively on victims and perpetrators of gross human rights violations, and her current research is on the intergenerational repercussions of historical trauma and on exploring what the repair of these transgenerational effects might mean in societies where victims, perpetrators and their descendants live together in the same country. Her books include the award-winning A Human Being Died That Night, A Story of Forgiveness, which won the Christopher Award in the United States in 2003 and the Alan Payton Award in South Africa in 2004, the co-authored volume Narrating Our Healing, Perspectives on Healing Trauma, and her edited study, Breaking Intergenerational Cycles of Repetition, a Global Dialogue on Historical Trauma and Memory. Since 2017, Pumla has been research advisor and global scholar at Queen's University Belfast, affiliated with the Mitchell Institute. After the lecture, William Crawley will engage Pumla in conversation to draw out some of the lecture's themes and arguments. We'd be grateful if you could kindly switch off your microphones and cameras, please. And now it's a great pleasure in order to hear the Senator George J. Mitchell Peace Lecture for 2020 on the subject, After Remorse, the Impossibility of Repair, to hand over to Professor Pumla Gobodo Madikizela. It is always a, a wonderful pleasure for me to return to Queens and uh, to connect with my colleagues at the Mitchell Institute. What a wonderful honor to be invited to be the speaker this year of the George Mitchell, annual George Mitchell uh, lecture. I am so privileged and I really appreciate and am very grateful um, to you Hastings and to John Brewer for uh, working with me on this to prepare for this, for this evening. Thank you very much. And thank you to you all, the audience uh, in the background there, in the virtual audience. With this title, After Remorse, The Impossibility of Repair, I want to convey the idea of an exploratory dialogue between, on the one hand, the status of my work on forgiveness and remorse, and on the other, reflections based on my position as witness to the slow disintegration of the vision of peace and reconciliation in my country, South Africa. The aim of this exploratory dialogue is to test some insights that have emerged in our work with colleagues at Stellenbosch University. This work examines the experiences of the younger generation of South Africans who did not grow up under apartheid and who were born at the dawn of our democracy and after. We were interested in the question of what it means to grow up in a post-apartheid South Africa, where the country is under a majority black government that at its inception promised, quote unquote, a better life for all. Having immersed ourselves in studies that speak of the repercussions of historical traumas, including the transmission of these traumas to subsequent generations, we wanted to know whether the phenomenon of transgenerational transmission of trauma produced as it is, as it has been, through studies of survivors of the Holocaust and their offspring means the same thing in the South African context. The data from our work and the data, quote unquote, from public discourse and the unfolding of social and political life 
since the fall of apartheid seems to suggest that not all is well with the vision of peace and reconciliation. In 1993, when Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk were announced winners of the Nobel Peace Prize, almost 10 years after Archbishop Desmond Tutu was awarded the prize for his relentless non-violent struggle to end apartheid, questions about whether de Klerk was deserving of this honor soon dissipated in part because of the symbolism, because of the horizon of hope that the moment offered. That at last a new country, a new future was in the making. This too was the spirit inspired by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one that led Archbishop Tutu to declare, let us move into the glorious future of a new kind of society where people count, not because of biological irrelevances or other extraneous attributes, but because they are persons of infinite worth created in the image of God, quote, close quote. It was a shining moment in our history, a moment whose enduring lessons about what is possible in the aftermath of so much tragedy. And this moment for me still shines brightly in my memory. As chair of the Human Rights Violations Committee in the Western Cape, I witnessed the hope that the moment inspired. Consider, for instance, the opening of the public hearings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The large city hall in the South African city of East London was capacity full, all black, with white TRC commissioners and some reporters, the only visible white people in the audience. When the audience rose to sing a song that was at once a poem and a kind of reparative lament during the most difficult years of apartheid repression, sung by black people at mass funerals, political rallies and peaceful protests, the song Liza Lisi Dingala Kongosi, Fulfill Your Promise Lord, reverberated into the large hall that you see, hope you see in this life now. And this music carried the hope that the moment promised. And so now, with a generation of young people growing up in this future that we imagined, and not all being well with this envisioned future, in my work, I have been asking the question, what went wrong with the vision of reconciliation? And so in the remainder of my paper tonight, I want to shift the spotlight away from victims and their descendants, perpetrators, I want to share two stories about perpetrators and about the significance of remorse in reconciliation processes. The first concerns Eugene de Kock, and the second concerns a man known as uh, Nivot, Gideon Nivot. Eugene de Kock was known as Prime Evil. I interviewed him when I served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. While he was known as Prime Evil, the, the best representation of remorse was also exemplified in Eugene de Kock's encounters with his, with, his, with his victims. Most of them referred to his experience of remorse as a genuine kind of remorse. Gideon Nivold was one of the most feared apartheid security officer in the Eastern Cape. This is a slide that shows how the perpetrators presented themselves at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You can see this slide is a very infamous uh, moment or famous moment of the Truth Commission where one of the perpetrators was asked by a victim 
to demonstrate how he tortured him. Now, like all these men who came to the commission, they carried these stories of torture, of poisoning uh, their victims. He also had a nickname. He was nicknamed Notorious, the Notorious Region Nivot. He was responsible for the murder of Steve Beagle and the torture, poisoning or, or, of a Timkulu, CPU Timkulu. Now, perpetrators were an important part of the Peace and Reconciliation vision of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC made provision for amnesty to be granted by, to perpetrators on condition, among others, that they give full disclosure for their crimes. I have argued in my work that the amnesty provision, while not perfect, created avenues for broadening our moral of justice and for healing deep fractures in our wounded nation by confronting perpetrators with their inhumanity, while at the same time humanizing them and holding them to greater moral accountability. Demonizing as monsters those who commit atrocities lets them off the hook too easily. An invitational process such as the TRC condemns the terrible deeds but not too hastily, lest it foreshortens the accountability process and purposely excuse the perpetrator or combatant by dismissing them into the category of the hopelessly radically other, thereby allowing them to distance themselves from the consequences of their actions. For purpose of my presentation tonight, let me simply mention that it was this context of amnesty that remorse was made possible. I will not go into too much detail about this process of amnesty. And perhaps we'll say more about that in conversation with William. The moral reflection that occurs with remorseful feeling can be quite painful. And because the perpetrator has to face the damage done and the fact of its irreparability daily, they need the affirmation of the wider community to confirm and validate their belonging and worthiness to be part of a moral community. The absence of such confirmation by the community, which the perpetrator has joined to reclaim their sense of being human, may lead to an undoing of the perpetrator's sense of personal identity a shattering and total disintegration of the self. And I'll say more about this in my um, reference to Eugene de Kock. In other words, in order to sustain the remorse, in order to carry the enormity of the burden of the atrocities that perpetrators have, have to confront daily, they need the acceptance of their remorse by the wider community. Now, a perpetrator's remorse for crimes that are committed as part of systemic oppression often evokes responses that question its authenticity. Remorse, however, can create transformative moments for the victim and others involved in the encounter with the remorseful perpetrators. The significance of remorse then is it to open up for the production of ethical subjects, both from the perspective of a victim who has been carrying a lot of complicated emotions about the trauma, as well as the subjects in societies that are emerging from mass trauma and violence. What are the characteristics of remorse? And I want to just say something very briefly about this. Now, we often assume that uh, when perpetrators exhibit a, a, a overt and excessive dramatic bodily expressions in the course of confrontation with their crimes, they are showing signs of remorse. There are several stories, examples of this. And one from, from South Africa, in fact, some of you may have watched the famous trial of the Blade Runner, the Olympian Oscar Pistorius, uh, about the murder of his girlfriend. And Oscar Pistorius broke down in court. He was throwing up. He was really almost like uh, performing 
a, a kind of remorse. And, and indeed, in, in the judgment and uh, the verdict that was passed by the judge, she cited uh, her um, understanding of the behavior as behavior that was remorseful. There's also the, the, the famous Joshua Oppenheimer film. Some of you may know this film, The Act of Killing where one of the, it's based in, it's a story from Indonesia, it's based on uh, these elderly men who operated as death squads during the 1965-1966 Indonesian uh, so-called communist purge. In this film, one of the men uh, acts out a kind of embodied type of, of, of remorse, what some scholars have called, have referred to, as, as a genuine sign of genuine remorse. So it's, a, it's an enactment, it's an acting out of, um, uh, of, of, of what seems to be remorse. Now, my own view on this is that it would be misleading to think that bodily reactions alone are a sign of remorse. It may well be that a perpetrator's remorse is made visible through embodied wrenching pain. But I think remorse emerges from a deep sense of guilt and recognition that the perpetrator's actions led to the harm and suffering of victims. In order to be meaningful, remorse should evoke feelings of concern for the victim, enough to wish to make amends, to repair the suffering that the perpetrator's actions caused. I, I see these acts, these other acts that I've referred to, these uh, dramatic bodily uh, uh, showing of, of, of signs of, of pain, as, as pain that really is more directed, focused on the self rather than on the other. This kind of remorse, the remorse that evokes feelings of concern for the victim, true remorse, although there are different levels of trueness in expressions of this kind of remorse which I will not go into in this, in this presentation tonight, suffice to say that it's my view that remorse occurs at a deeply internal level, intrapsychic level, cognitive level, and it requires certain characteristics. One is that it's an admission of wrongdoing without any excuse or justification. The perpetrator should not only face their guilt, but they should also feel their guilt. This is an important distinction between because a perpetrator can simply face up to what they have done, but deny personal responsibility by rationalizing their actions with justification. For instance, it was a war or I was obeying orders. And in such cases, it is as if the person was saying, I give you what you want, full disclosure. Here is a list of evil deeds in which, in which I participated under orders. The second important part about remorse is acknowledgement of personal responsibility of the perpetrator's actions and recognition of the pain and suffering that these actions have caused. I consider acknowledgement the knowledge that answers the question, what happened? in a way that goes beyond simply dishing out facts, the most critical aspect of remorse. In fact, Albi Sachs, former justice, retired justice, and he himself suffered um, hugely from the atrocities of, uh, of, of apartheid. He has this to say about, uh, about uh, uh, this point about acknowledgement. He reflects on testimonies at the TRC and argues that, quote, Acknowledgement presupposes a sense of responsibility for the occurrence and understanding, an understanding of the meaning that it has for the persons involved and for society as a whole. In other words, the, the responsibility for the occurrence must be fully understood by the perpetrator as having resulted in the consequences in human life or in the pain and suffering of, of, of their victims. And so a perpetrator has to face this and acknowledge that he, he or she is the one who did it. Acknowledgement of wrongdoing that conveys a preparedness 
to take responsibility involves responding in a manner that implies care. This is very central, caring for the other, showing that in this response of remorse, I am so concerned about the other, I care for the other. And I find my language offers very powerful ways of capturing the meaning of this caring for the other. The sense of responsibility in the closer phrase, for instance, of to take responsibility. The expression is ukutata ukandova or ukutwala ukandova. In other words, to bear responsibility for an act. Now, both this, this word, both in its onomatopoetic sound and in its actual meaning, points to an obligation to carry the burden of moral responsibility and being susceptible to another's suffering. Used in this context, it denotes the capacity to see the other's pain and to care enough to carry the responsibility for the burden of the harm that the perpetrator's actions have imposed on the victim. The repeated calls for acknowledgement by different groups of indigenous people, descendants of of, of, um, of oppressed groups, they're crying out for this kind of acknowledgement. An important dimension of acknowledgement that we should make more explicit here is the acknowledgement of the debt that perpetrators owe to their conscience, at least those who have a working conscience, which they repeatedly suppressed to the point that allowed them to commit the horrible acts against others. The problem is not only suppression of the perpetrator's conscience, but also the society or ideology that enables such suppression to occur to the point that a perpetrator can allow themselves to commit horrible acts against others. Therefore, the acknowledgement of complicity by those who benefited from the human rights violations of perpetrators the members of the group in a position of privilege as beneficiaries of oppressive policies that targeted another group is as important as the validation of the perpetrator's remorse by the group of beneficiaries. In other words, the community of others that supported the perpetrators ought to receive and hold the perpetrator's own remorse because it was for them that the acts were committed. Now, I'll say one last aspect, and then I come back to the of the importance of the community support. A third aspect of remorse that should be present is the sense from the victim's perspective that the remorse signals a change in the perpetrator. When remorse is experienced by the victim as genuine, there is an expectation, a promise, deeds for which the perpetrator is remorseful will not occur again. This is the kind of promise that Hannah Arendt has argued serves to, quote, undo historical crimes. Arendt does not suggest that these crimes can be undone or obliterated from memory. Rather, she recognizes that the condition of the irreparability of these crimes is something that, that exists, that remains. But that the promise then, the promise is in that this will not happen again. The irreparability exists and remains, and this is the challenge we face with these crimes. But that when there is this sense of a, a, a genuine sense of promise that this, the crimes will not happen again, then this acts as a corrective that allows people to continue living together and working together to build a new future in which the humanity of all members of the society is recognized. What makes remorse possible is the perpetrator's subject position of facing their guilt, being accountable and acknowledging personal responsibility. However, it's also important that the community does the same. But what we find is that Often, perpetrator will recognize their crime and acknowledge their crime, but because the perpetrator is now identified as the one 
who holds and carries all the evil of the past, they are the ones who now carry it alone without the supportive environment of a community that accepts it. And on the contrary, there is a rejection of the perpetrator as has happened with Eugene de Kock. Eugene de Kock in South Africa, when he was released, the first encounter he had in a public, at a public event was an encounter with an audience that was predominantly white. And his presence in the room was rejected by the majority of the people in the room who sent a message out to the chair of that event. He, had, he was attending the launch of a book about himself. And there was a message that he is not welcome in the room. And this was a majority white audience. And the consequence of that was a deep disintegration of de Kock's sense of self only weeks after that event. He went back and he had to be hospitalized. He had a psychiatric breakdown. My argument here about remorse being a both a, a blessing and a curse concerns this issue of the facing of the past, one facing a perpetrator like Gijin de Kock, facing their terrible past alone and not being held by a community of others in order to be kept, to be able to carry this burden. Now, I want for a, a, a few uh, minutes here before I speak about uh, uh, Nivot and the problem of, of, uh, of the problems that his testimony um, exemplifies in, in the challenge of reconciliation. I want to just say something about why the breakdown happens. What happens when perpetrators face this break, breakdown? First of all, it's important to understand, as I pointed out earlier, that remorse happens at a very deeply intrapsychic level. The reason perpetrators are able to commit their crimes has to do with the capacity for what in psychoanalytic terms we call a splitting. In other words, a splitting between the self that can commit the crime and a perception of the self as a good person, for instance, a loving father, a church-going, you know, a, a citizens, and an upstanding person, and, and reframing the acts of atrocity as a moral act. In other words, they are murdering apartheid, uh, anti-apartheid activists as an act, as, as an act that actually responds to the call by Christians to destroy the Antichrist. And this is what some of these people said, and most notably the man who killed Sani. He said, we were sent, we were messengers of God. We were, we were destroying the Antichrist. This is what we as Christians have to do. It's a splitting. This is the, under the word that explains what happens here is the splitting. Splitting is more than simply rendering separate the disparate parts of self and other. In other words, it's more than simply just, you know, these two parts are separate. It is a holding on to the one that what the person considers to be the good part of the self. In other words, I'm, doing, I'm serving my country. I'm acting for my, for my fellow South Africans. I am destroying these ANC people in order to maintain law and order. I want my fellow white South Africans to sleep soundly at night. So this is now, all this narrative is about holding on to the good, creating the good aspect of the self, creating this narrative while splitting off the other meaning of what the perpetrator is doing. Perpetrator's actions are imbued with elements that diminish their moral and ethical obligations towards the victims. But this is silenced in the course of these actions. The splitting makes it possible for them to continue to murder and to, you know, to torture and, and all of this. And splitting, therefore, the, the fact that they're able to dehumanize their victims, their victim standings are reduced, the humanity of their victims in, in their eyes is reduced. 
and it allows them to commit their deeds without flinching. Eugene de Kock, again, who was this famous prime evil known as prime evil, he described this process of splitting. He didn't call it splitting, but it is, I understood it to be splitting. He described separation uh, of, of, of the, the, the self and the, the kind of blinding of, uh, of the perpetrator to the humanity of the victim in the following way, in quotes. He describes a moment, um, he's describing a moment of, of uh, attacking his victims. He says, quote, in that second or two seconds, you sometimes see the other person's face. I can see some of the faces today still. The shock, the fear, the desperation, the look of this is it. No, you do see these people. It's real. I mean, this person is alive and you can see the fear, but you are on automatic because your training takes over. You don't allow yourself to think of the faces you see. Close quote. This issue of whether perpetrators see the faces of victims has been discussed and remarked upon by several scholars who have written about perpetrators. I mentioned here, there's Dan Baron who's done his studies on Nazi perpetrators, there's a, the famous book by Gita Serene, who uh, uh, interviewed um, one, the SS Nazi commander in Auschwitz, Franz Stangl. And Franz Stangl couldn't remember any of the faces he told uh, uh, Gita Serene. Couldn't remember the faces of the people he killed. Now, in contrast, Eugene de Kock, this, the, when Eugene says, I can see the faces, this is important for us to understand what's going on here and what's going on now that he's struggling with his remorse, he's facing his remorse, facing his victims. Who is de Kock? What kind of a perpetrator is he? Who is he? Who was he then and who is he now? In my view, what this suggests is the possibility that in certain cases, a working conscience and some degree of critical moral reflection, even during the perpetration of murderous acts, may be present. For these perpetrators, splitting and attempts to obliterate the humanness of the victims is not very really successful. To make it work repeatedly, the psychological cutting off of one's sense of reality or reinforcements of behavior that perpetuates this this avowal of reality, this splitting in other words, it needs constant justification. The incessant weaving of guilt, its repudiation through justification, projection of the perpetrator's destructiveness into victims, for instance, to say that, you know, they deserve it, they killed my people, it's because it's a war and so on. And the chaotic process of this complex dynamic of projections and confronting with the guilt, confrontation with their guilt, trying to disavow the guilt, it may overwhelm perpetrators. And when the splitting fails, the bite of conscience, as it has been called uh, in, in Freudian terms, may express itself in a range of symbolic ways. For instance, I write in my book about the cock when he came back to one of his murderous operations when he had to take several showers because the smell of blood in his body, on, on his skin, wouldn't leave him. And he, he was taking these several showers and wiping off and taking another shower, but the smell just remained on his body. A more striking example of how this, the, of this importance of seeing the faces and how it operates how it operated in Eugene de Kock is when he encounters the daughter of one of his victims that he had murdered more than a decade earlier, Marcia Koza, whose mother was murdered by Eugene de Kock when she was five years old, um, went to prison to visit Eugene de Kock in her late 20s. As she waited for him to be brought out of the, from the prison cells, visitor's waiting area, Koza sat at a strategic position that would allow her to watch the cock when he walked in to meet her. 
when their eyes met, the cock tripped his balance as he walked towards where Koza sat. The first thing he said to her, you look so much like your mother. He could still see some of the faces of the victims of his murderous deeds, he said, he has told me when I interviewed him. And now he remembers the face of the mother of this young woman. Seeing the faces of his victims made them real for him. No longer were they dehumanized objects. The daughter of the woman he killed was sitting in front of him and it was almost as if it is the victim herself. She was real. And not only because she is just the offspring, but also because she is alive in his memory. Victims in his memory are no longer objectified and reduced to an unbearable smell that clung to his skin. They exist as a living memory of human beings whose lives were snuffed out by his actions. The need for the reparative act to reconcile the split of parts of the self and hence to face his guilt is stronger because of the full recognition of the other's subjectivity, not as object representation in his internal world, and as mere objects that fall outside of his moral sensibilities that he shared with others on whose behalf he was committed his atrocities, but as living human beings. Now, when he's facing this, and he is experiencing the remorse as a result of facing his crimes and feeling the sense of guilt, and because he does not have this holding that he he needs from his community of others for whom he was committing the crimes and for himself, of course. But he's left alone to, to hold this immense atrocity, memory of an atrocity. And this is where remorse falls apart. This is where the danger of remorse falls apart because now he's facing it, but he's gone, he went to fight almost as if by looking at himself, he cannot reconcile. Because remorse is really about reconciling that past and the, the person who did it. But he's gone so far deep into the abyss of darkness that it's, it's difficult and impossible to reclaim this darkness as being the same self that he wants to be now. And because there is no... One, there is no feeling of being held, he falls back into the abyss. This is why some perpetrators and most perpetrators will deny, you know, and not face the guilt because it's too much to bear. They are afraid of going back and deep into this darkness because they, they cannot bear it. De Kock went into the darkness, looked into the and saw himself there. And now, how does he bring it back to connect with who he is? And that is the challenge of remorse. Now, here is the bigger challenge of remorse. Because there is this community out there on whose behalf these crimes were committed, they too ought to bear some of the accountability. But because of the rejection of these acts and the denial, for the same reason, if they accept the court's remorse, then they are accepting accountability or their own responsibility in his acts. So they stay away, they keep away, they distance themselves. He was primeval, it's not who they are. And so the denial, the problem with this is that then it does not serve the purpose of reconciliation. Reconciliation occurs when there is a, an acceptance of this past, an acknowledgement of, a, of wrongdoing, whether it's the doer of the deed or the beneficiaries from these deeds. This is what we're faced with in South Africa. Over the past 25 years, this has not happened. Besides the, the question of the issue of economic justice, there is this important symbolic aspect of the process. The symbolism of acknowledgement goes a very long way. It's very important. It's an important starting point. This was the critical significance of the Truth Commission 
Some people criticize the Truth Commission and say it did not go far enough. But I think the purpose of the Truth Commission was precisely for this symbolism. Other things should have followed and they didn't. And so the continued denial or the, the absence of accountability by the larger society has played out both in this man who represents the evil of apartheid by his breaking down and disintegrating and spending time in, in, a, in, a, in a psychiatric hospital, and at the same time by the disruption that these denials continue to cause in our country. The failure to acknowledge, the failure of acknowledgement, the distancing of the society that benefited from the crime, from these crimes, does the reconciliation vision a disservice. And this is in part, not the whole story, this is in part what is happening in South Africa today. Now, there is another part which I'm going to complete my presentation tonight. There is another question, so this is a question of where a perpetrator comes to the Truth Commission, they acknowledge wrongdoing and experience a sense of remorse, and some of the victims, and certainly not all victims, accepted the remorse, but some of the significantly the acts of acceptance by victims were significant enough to be spoken about, and that was important. There is, on the other hand, the danger of truths that are perceived as, that at least gain the status of truth or, or some level of truth at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and victims may accept, half accept these truths, but they remain because they are what perpetrators uh, reported. They remain on the records in the archive of the Truth Commission as the stories that were told as the truth. And since they were never fully really investigated because there was no serious doubt on this, now, years after the Truth Commission, there have been emerging, there have emerged certain information that challenge these truths that are told at the Truth Commission. Gideon Nivold, who I mentioned earlier, is the terrible, the notorious Nivold, murdered so many uh, um, uh, anti-apartheid activists in the Eastern Cape um, uh, that he, he himself uh, can, could not state how many people he had murdered. There were some people who stood out, of course, as the uh, uh, the high-profile uh, victims, but there were several others for which their actions were responsible. At the Truth Commission, Gideon Nivold uh, um, was testifying to the Amnesty Committee about the murder of Simpiwam Timkulu. Simpiwam Timkulu was captured by Nivold, tortured and poisoned. And he died of the poison. He, he was brought. He was, he was ill for many months. He was ill, and when he went to, he was trying to uh, to institute a suit to claim damages from Nivold and his colleagues. He was abducted, and he died at their hands. He was murdered. They confessed to murdering Sipium Timkulu, and when the mother of Timkulu wanted the body to know where they buried the body. They said they burned it on a stake over several hours and then wrapped it in plastic bag and threw it in Fish River, which is a large river in the Eastern Cape. Now, the parents were so de desperate to have some information about where the sun is that they went, they gathered the community of relatives and went to the banks of the Fish River and conducted a ceremony to bid their son goodbye, to, you know, conduct the kind of rituals that they would have done if they had had the, his body. Several years later, when the investigators who are responsible for the exhumation of secret graves by these perpetrators, when they discovered, when they were involved in 
uh, investigating the, car, the, the site of the crime where Tim Kulu was tortured and where they believe he was burnt by these perpetrators, they discovered that he was, his body and the bodies of others were dumped in a cistern tank. Now, they had told the families that the bodies were dumped in the river, and here they were in this, in this tank on a farm just outside of Craddock, hidden there and gathering all the mold in, in, with this water. They had to uh, exhume, so to speak, the bodies from this tank. So here was the truth that the bodies were buried here. And this is not the only untruth that was told at the Truth Commission. And one can imagine what happens when victims leave at the Truth Commission feeling a sense of remorse, uh, relief, because they, have, they are going away with some sense of truth about what happened to their loved ones. And years later, they discover that this was not true. It undoes and reopens the wounds that when had not even healed. And so people have to begin the journey all over again. Now, this is not just about a story of individuals, stories that are told at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were stories shared by the larger community of people. So when, these, when we reflect on these kinds of incidents, you can imagine also how the sense of being unfinished, of sense of being something not quite complete among victims collectively, victims of oppression collectively, that there's something that's missing. And it seems to me that if we look back at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and we read these stories, these narratives, almost as text, in other words, you go back to the moment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, now that you are here, at the moment of that future that we are building, 25 years later, we have a chance to actually rethink our responses at the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that chance means we can reread this, rethink what victims told, the stories that are told by victims of the Truth Commission. And that allows us to reinterpret that moment as a moment perhaps that was about a foretelling of the future. If you look at that image that we showed on that slide, those slides, if you look at that slide, the slides of this man who shows what he did to the victims, the torturing with what was called the so-called black bag method. What kind of country will emerge from that kind of thing? If people, this was done to people, if people were buried in secret graves, were tortured, thrown in rivers, killed and communities massacred, these stories that have come to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they tell us that this is not something that can be repaired that the word reconciliation is a word that we need to revise, we need to rethink this word, that in the, in the context that happened in our history, we need to think about other ways of dealing with it. I suggest that the way to think about how we move forward is to think around the word reparative, the reparative process, that we think really about not so much about reconciliation or forgiving or forgiveness, because these have a goal. You are going to forgive. There's kind of like an end point. There is a, we are talking here about hurts and pain that remain in people carry in their bodies. If you watch that, there's something visceral about that. And when we think about the notion of what is the transferred pain, Stories about what happened here that were not finished, were not completed, they are stored, as it were, as memories and passed on to the next generation so that the pain is felt deeply by the next generation that now has to complete the work of healing. But even with this generation that has to complete this work, carrying the pain from the past, but dealing with the present contemporary issues of 
pain and suffering and dehumanization by its own, by their own government. What hope is there for us to actually heal from this language of repression? This is why I propose, I am exploring and I propose the notion of reparative humanism. That it is in this concept of reparative humanism that we can think about ways of connecting to one another so that it's not so much about finishing and completing, you know, coming to an end of reconciling or forgiving, but rather connecting in solidarity, thinking about how do you connect in solidarity as fellow human beings in order that we take, we share the responsibility of moving forward to build a sense of social justice in our countries that are hurt by this past. That the notion of repair suggests an ongoing process. It's almost like you wake up every day, you have to repair. Nothing is finished. And this is why I think so many people don't want to engage with these questions. It's too, it's too, it's too complicated. It's too taxing. So they turn the other way. They don't want to deal with it. I end with a story that illustrates this point about the fear of facing this every day. Some of you may know of Annie Beale, the story of Annie Beale, who was killed by young black activists, anti-apartheid activists in South Africa. The parents came to South Africa to the commission to hear the testimonies of these young men. And after the year, they were granted amnesty. And after, at the end of that process, they adopted these young men and worked with them at the Emmy Bill Foundation so that they are now, they, they contribute meaningfully to the project of reconciliation. One of these men at some point left, one of the killers of Emmy Bill, left the, the foundation. And, and, and Linda Bill, Emmy Bill's mother, sought him out and brought him back again. I interviewed this young man. I was teaching a course at the University of Cape Town called Trauma in Context. And one of the things we used to do is to invite either victims or perpetrators who were willing to engage with the class. We invited them to our class, and I asked him to explain to the class why he decided to leave. And he said something that is so important for us to understand about what we mean by rehabilitating perpetrators. He said, I couldn't bear to look at the kindness of Linda, of Amy Bill's mother every day. I couldn't bear to look at her kindness. And so he went back, he left, and he went to join his comrades. And they started, they were, they were you know, because these are comrades who had been involved in these anti-apartheid movement, movements, they were trained, you know, combatants. They used their training in cash hides, in robbing banks, and so forth. So he went to that life for a moment. So I asked him, but how can you, what does it mean to try to go back to the life of violence if you can't face, because, you know, the thinking is that, well, if you can't face, then maybe you do something different. He says, this life, in this life, I don't have to think. And this is why it's important for us to recognize these challenges, the limits of remorse, so that as we think about rehabilitation, we can also think about the dangers, or rather the limitations, or, or, and indeed the dangers. Because then if perpetrators slip back into this abyss, rather than rejoining moral humanity to contribute back to society, then our projects of rehabilitating them are for naught. And so it's important to be conscious of this, and this is where I would like to end my contribution tonight. Thank you very much. Pumla, thank you so much. That was that was really uh, fantastic. Unfortunately, I've got about 15 pages now of, of questions for our conversation, because I find that fascinating. Uh, but we have 20, 30 minutes, I think. Um, you have taken us on an extraordinary journey here, really, uh, starting with the slow disintegration of peace and reconciliation in South Africa, trying to make sense of that, beginning there with the TRC, then taking on this psychological journey through trauma, the trauma of perpetrators and analysis of remorse, 
taking that and linking it to community and, and finally coming back to the TRC with what strikes me as a remarkable critique, because what you have done by the end of, of your analysis is to pitch to us a kind of ethic of empathy in reparative humanism, as you describe it. Uh, and so I want to kind of go back to the TRC with you through the lens you brought us to and, and just see how far you want to make that critique further. Uh, many people criticized Desmond Tutu at the time and subsequently for spiritualizing that tribunal experience. And, and you've also shown us the theatrical dimensions of that tribunal experience. Uh, and it's as if what you're saying by the end of this lecture is I, I fully agree with that, actually. Uh, the, the spiritualization that we saw televised by Max Dupre and others famously uh, um, across the tribunal um, was, was part of a journey of a kind of religious or spiritual journey of reconciliation. And that was the wrong path to be on. We should be on a different path, a path towards restoration and repair. Does that does that capture it? It, it does not. Let me tell you what I, I how I'd like to respond to the point that you're making. Yes, there was this criticism, but I think it was misplaced for the following reason. You know, the religious, those songs that were sung at the Truth Commission, you know, for instance, I referenced the song, one of the songs that was sung um, uh, uh, to open the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Liza Lissi Alako. Every Black South African, at least from my generation, knows that song. Mm. They will sing that song anywhere. What is important for me about this issue is that these, that religion, what was criticized as a religious injunction, was actually a, a ritualistic way of holding the space for, 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 the, for victims, for people who had suffered. This, this criticism didn't come from people who were the audience. It came from scholars, from academics, and so on. The people who were there themselves, they took this for granted, mm -hmm. you know, that this is what happens when you are dealing with these more harrowing moments. You open with a prayer. You open with a, 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 a song that is significant, the power of the song, and the power of the words. I mean, the words, for instance, of this song, Liza Lisi Dingalako, fulfill your promise, Lord. It's almost like a it's almost like a, a national anthem. In fact, it was composed by Tio Soga, who himself was is known to have been involved in the formation of the TRC uh, of the African National Congress in, in the 18, early 1900s. So that song was like an anthem, and so it is sacred for black people. Prayer even for people, you know, who are not necessarily Christians. There is no, for them, it's not about not being a Christian. It's about this is a ritual, mm. an observance of a moment that is sacred. And in order to do that, we call upon what we understand. We, we know best how to do this. And so, the, the, that's that's not what I mean. I I am in fact I think that the criticism about that particular issue was highly highly misplaced. I mean the candles, the Archbishop would like candles in memory of of people who have died. We would mm. stand and recognize in a moment of silence. All of that was important mm. and is part of the symbolism of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the critique is very misplaced. What about the um the focalization of forgiveness that was encouraged. Yeah, okay, that, that even I am reviewing, I, well, let me say the following. The importance of forgiveness at that particular moment was that it opened up a kind of conversation about what's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we know historically with these kinds of crimes that, you know, for instance, with the with the um, uh, uh, with the Holocaust, mm. the language of forgiveness was almost, you know, forbidden. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, the scholars actually there was like a, you know, thou shalt not forgive. Uh, the way that the 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 scholarship around forgiveness was pursued, it was a kind of uh, of a scholarship that was about prescribing 
what you ought to do. You ought not forgive, you know, these kinds of crimes. There was kind of a, an oughtness about it. What we found with the Truth and Reconciliation is that actually you can't put a limit to how people, the relationships and the connectedness between people happens. You can't, you can't control that. And so that language was important just to show us that it's possible for people to actually come together. Now, the language of forgiveness itself, and, and, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm exploring in my work, mm. the language of forgiveness um, is, a, is, is actually not accurate, doesn't accurately capture what happens. Even when people say, I forgive, in my view, it's much more than yeah. I forgive. The much more that I'm referring to, it has to do with just people being able to, you know, remember that splitting apartheid was the was the splitting of the mind. You know, it wasn't not not just about you know uh, I can mix with a white person. It was actually in the mind, whiteness and blackness are separate in the mind. And so, what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did, and with through these acts of forgiving, it made possible the potential for people to mm. connect. I look at forgiven, forgiveness as really a process of connection with one's former enemy. There is, of course, the question of, well, was this where people forced and so on? I, I wouldn't say forced. I think that there is a, le a level at which, because the environment, the mm -hmm. context is a context where we are now talking about reconciliation. And in this context, you know, we sort of, ex there's an expectation. Yes. So, 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 so Pondo, yeah, you, you, way, you've met is, you've met people who will have uh, and they've been interviewed. We've seen interviews with people who say, "I didn't feel ready to use the language of forgiveness. Yeah. I felt coerced mm, in this situation. Yeah. I felt spiritually coerced to mm. move to that point when I wasn't ready to be there." So that's what I mean about kind of overly spiritualizing uh, the experience of people moving through trauma. But you also mentioned amnesty, and that's the context around all of this, which gives a kind of transactional nature or character to the TRC. Um, and you invited me to ask you some some questions about that, because this is something we talk about a lot, as you can imagine, in, in Northern Ireland um, and the potential injustices connected to amnesty. After all these years, what are your thoughts on on the amnesty process as it worked out in South Africa? You know, William, it's it's very you know. In so, so what we what I have found, what I have come to accept, is that none of these processes are perfect or can mm. be perfect. That we've got to hold the ambivalence. That that we've got to recognize that there was a need for this kind of thing, for whatever it was, for what it was worth. There was a need for this process because it allowed a certain kind of conversation to take place. At the same time, the way that this amnesty, the amnesty was granted sometimes, seemed arbitrary. And mm. as a result, you know, it undervalued yeah. you know, the suffering of victims. And, and so there are those 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 challenges with the problem, you know, that the fact that the amnesty process required perpetrators to give full disclosure, it allowed perpetrators, for instance, the story I shared at the end where Nivold blatantly lied, lied, you know, to the commission. Mm -hmm. Not only did he lie, then after, just before he was recalled to the commission, because of other tech, some technicalities. Before he went there, he sought out the family and went to their home to ask their forgiveness and reiterated the lie that he told to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission all the time, knowing that he was lying. So there is, you know, there, there is a challenge with this process, but I wouldn't say that one should throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think that we recognize the limitation and perhaps a, a greater rigor in, a, you know, in terms of investigations of, you know, the veracity of what perpetrators told the Truth Commission, 
there, there was there was a, a, an investigating arm, you know, mm -hmm. of the commission, but evidently, you know, it, it was limited. Remember also that a huge number of documents were were, were thrown out, were destroyed just before the commission. In fact, even long after the truth commission. Mm. So my answer to the question is the, the, the complexity of the moment and its historical significance should allow us, should enable us to, to hold the ambivalence that, you know, and, and, and be able to accept that this is what it was for, for the purposes that it served at the time. But of course, one another point that you are alluding to is the question whether these processes can be universalized. And the answer, of course, is no. You know, that, that we, we, we learn, we draw from them what is important to learn, what mm. insights are important, but they cannot be replicated, you know, as they are because they may not you know, they're not, they may not necessarily be appropriate, but the notion that, you know, you, you, give, a little, you give something a little bit to perpetrators in order to get some truth, even if it's not the, the whole mm. truth, as we know, it happened, but that something happens. You know, these truths were exposed and these farms that uh, were owned by these people in, in Pretoria, in the outskirts of Port Elizabeth, where the graves I have not all been dug out. Yeah. The process still remains. I mean, all those people whose bodies have not been found, they are hidden in these graves. In fact, mm. some of these graves were that were identified, they would be they would be identified and perpetrators would say, oh, the three people were, are buried in such and such a grave. They go to exhume the grave, they find 12 more people in the mm. same grave. It's impossible to know who are they because all, you know, that the, uh, uh, the investigators that are exhuming these graves, they are looking for the particular, they've got the DNA for these three people. So yeah. who are the 12 others? So you can imagine, this is what I mean by all of this, you wake up and you are driving and there are all these graves, or you encounter these perpetrators who killed and murdered and maimed in such violent ways, and we live with them as neighbors. You know, we meet them in supermarkets. I mean, some of the children of victims have told stories of encountering perpetrators at supermarkets. One young man who became a, a, a traffic officer encountered the son of Gideon Nivold, you know, stopped a, a, a driver mm -hmm. and he saw the name Nivold. He says, do you know this the Gideon Nivold? And it turned out it was his father. So well, how do you heal when there are all these yeah. reality, these things that, you know, these unfinished stories that are still out there? That, that can be the danger of amnesty because it can start off as you know, a, a well-intentioned storytelling process can end up as a negotiation in terms of kind of paying a necessary price to get across that bridge and to get Absolutely. what you want out of it. Exactly. Can I ask you as a psychologist about, and I'm glad you brought up The Act of Killing. It's a remarkable film, absolutely extraordinary film, a very unsettling film, about the power, the importance of, of this kind of sort of theatrical reenactment. I mean, I know there's a place for drama in therapy and in trauma therapy, but not normally while television cameras are there in a, in a tribunal. Uh, how, do you, how do you process that as a psychologist? Now, I don't know whether to respond to the question of the uh, uh, act of killing or to the notion of using film. Um, I have very strong views about the act of killing. Uh, I have very strong views. And um, if I could men mention one of them, you know, I mean, the way that the film is 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 done, it, it's really it shows just the the, it's the how deep the denial in that country is. Yeah. Just even even that the 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 scenes in that film were mm -hmm. possible. You know, right in the communities mm -hmm. where people were hurt and wounded, and the way that it's done, you know. I find it, you know, there's something about it for me that's 
that's just a uh, grating. I mean, I, I cringe from that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. and, and when I think, about it, would you do that? For instance, in Germany, you go to a, a, a yeah. town where Jewish people were exterminated yeah. and, and, and do a film of that, invite the perpetrators and ask them to enact. You wouldn't do that. So why was it done? Why was this possible in the way? Then, sorry to interrupt, but also to see in some cases the perpetrators enjoying exactly. the reenactment because they knew there were no consequences to it. And thinking back, for example, at one scene I cannot get out of my head of one of these perpetrators talking about the rape of a child and talking about it as the good old days. Yeah. And there were no consequences because uh, the transaction had been done in terms of the amnesty. That's the extent of the of the denial. In fact, it's interesting because what what come, memory is a, is a strange thing. What what popped up in my memory is how today with corruption and the violence of corruption, how it has been normalized. That is mm. almost like you know the people who are known to have committed these acts of corruption. They come and go. I mean, the son of yeah. Jacob comes and he's cheered and people surround him. There's excitement. There's no sense that you know, of shame, you know, there's no sense that this is something shameful. And mm -hmm. and so the these, uh, but, but film, but, but then back to the, to your question, the, the power of film, if you could, uh, uh, the slide, the last slide, please, if you could show that last slide in slide number seven, the power of film can be very healing. There is, um, were we able to get to the last slide just to show people the last slide on my slides? Is this possible? So anyway, what, what the, the is, that slide shows how a perpetrator, go, it's a film called Black Christmas, and it's about a perpetrator who goes back to the community uh, to seek forgiveness. And it doesn't end there. He, 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 he is today involved. This is Stefan Kutsier. Stefan Skutier and, and one of the victims, these people from, from Worcester, where he planted a bomb and it killed several people. And they, they decided to, uh, to, to go to prison to take, to take a train. You know, the, a train was hired for them to go to meet Stefan because the prison wouldn't release him to the community. And so that you, scene you see there is after... Mm -hmm. He had made a speech, a heartfelt speech about, you know, apologizing for his deeds. And uh, he, he, then when he was released on parole, he went back to the community. So you can see the importance of this film, because when we showed the film, Mark Kaplan, did the, who does a lot of these films, um, or human rights related films, really as, as, a, as a person himself, who is pursuing truth through the lens. I mean, this is, I think, very important that these people do, and I know also uh, um, at the Mitchell Institute, some of the colleagues do use film a lot uh, to pursue truth, but also to expose truth, but to, to also present it, represent the truth in communities so that you can create language to talk about what happened through the medium of something creative like that. And you create new conversations. For instance, we're able to show the film to audiences, different audiences. And we've had different responses, some mm -hmm. not welcoming, some angry because it focuses on the perpetrator, but some people feeling a sense of um, being acknowledged because of the the depth of of a uh, 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 of the of truth truthfulness with which this young man is relating to what he mm. did in the past, and so it's it's healing even for people who were not necessarily at that scene to meet this man. People were affected. Remember these crimes may be narratives told by individuals, but as they're telling the story, there are several people who are actually living excuse me living through their stories listening to the stories but re-experiencing and so the moment for them is also a moment of telling of their own stories and so vicariously you know the impact of that moment of being heard is also felt by those who are not necessarily on the stage. Pumla, can I ask you about the limits of repair? You've laid out in, in quite complex terms actually uh, 
the dynamics of repair as you see the possibility of, of repair, which involves remorse and the community acceptance in some ways, going to that dark place with that perpetrator in order to embrace them. Difficult concept that, but to embrace them and, and to restore them. But isn't the reality also that there are some perpetrators who are beyond repair? There are, there are psychopaths, there are sociopaths, there are people who lack empathy, lack a sense of conscience, could not have a sense of conscience. And, and if they talk even about splitting in your psychoanalytic terms, they're faking it. Yeah, well, th exactly. Th this is this is very important to know that not all perpetrators are redeemable. Some perpetrators are irredeemable, and and we we have to draw a distinction between those and and the ones who have, as I said in my in in my in my talk earlier, those who have some vestiges of conscience, even as they are operating, patients, their conscience is constantly challenging them. Mm. Now, we know also in the scholarship that, I mean, if, even if you think about Nazi Germany, that the majority of people who were, although there were psychopaths to be sure, but the majority of people were like you and I, they were not necessarily, you know, uh, 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 you know, psychopaths. And this is, this is a finding that has been made within the scholarship that uh, the majority of people who commit these crimes are ordinary people, they're not perpetrators, but the, you do find, and especially this kind of thing, it attracts those kinds of people. So you do find them as well. And so the question of, of course, there's always this question, is this genuine, you know, is this witness stand remorse? And you, you know, William, sometimes, and I think I would say often, if one listens and listens deeply, you can see something that is being faked. You know, um, you can feel it, and especially for victims. You know, especially people who have been wounded. You can you can see that this is a a performance of remorse. There there is a it's it's on the surface. You know, there is no depth uh, uh, to it. And and we see it if moving beyond perpetrators because really you know if you think about who are the people who kept these perpetrators going mm. they are the majority of the population that yeah. benefited from these crimes right. so we we also have to think about what are the strategies of, of people at you know who benefited from these crimes what what strategies do they use. Mm. to try to escape accountability and, and what is the consequence what are the consequences of um of of their response to these crimes and this is what we are we are, we are facing because mm. perpetrators, you can you know a thousand two thousand five whatever the number is um, but our neighbors are people yeah. who benefited from these crimes and often they are the ones who struggle to to face that past because it's too ghastly for them to contemplate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, uh, the consequences of actually facing their accountability and they, that they benefited from it. And I get that because it's very difficult for a community, isn't it? Um, mm. To to it's easy to say you're primeval. It's easy to say you're a monster. You're a demon. It's mm. more difficult to say. You came from us. Let's yeah. talk about how that happened. And uh, we are part of you. And if we're going to move on as a society, that means we get restored, you get restored. We do that together. That's a very difficult thing, particularly, and I want to come to this actually, for politicians and for policymakers. Um, because and we see this with the whole debate about prison reform and re rehabilitation. It's a lot easier to say, lock them up, throw the keys away, than it is to talk in these complex psychological terms. We often hear politicians in Northern Ireland saying of uh, perpetrators, if I can use that language, leave the stage, go away, pack up and go away. But what you're saying to us is if we want to have a truly healed future, we can't have perpetrators going away and leaving the stage. We need to find a new place for them in the family of our community. And to find a place in the family of our community, 
some there has to be some act of recognition that they were not acting alone. I mean, in, mm. in the sense that there was a whole society behind them, even those who say lock them up, those who say, oh, these were you know just bad apples and so forth. I mean, just recently in South Africa, FWD Clerk said made a statement publicly to say that apartheid was not a crime against humanity. And so, I mean, those kinds of statements reinforce the denial because then all the people who supported this and voted, uh, you know, the apartheid government in, in power, they now have a reason to deny, to say, oh, what matters actually now is the problem of corruption. There's nothing to, 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 uh, to confess or to be guilty about the past. We are now, we have a problem with corruption. And, and, and so it allows the denial to be perpetuated. And unfortunately, perpetrators are the ones who bear the brunt. You know, they're the ones who are left with this burning stick. And um, and, and then, of course, because the, the community around them is in denial, mm -hmm. it's either, you know, putting the burden on them or helping them to deny. So we find, for instance, there are people here, there's a, a man called Dr. Death, whose role in the South African Defense Force was to ma manufacture poison. I mean, mm. this was a mm. heart doctor, heart specialist. When this person was facing, you know, trial, there was a community of white people who said, oh, you know, he's a great heart specialist and so on. And all of these letters to the to the editors in newspapers and so on and so how just, you know, vouching for how great he is it would be to to suddenly strip him of his license to practice is denying them of the kind of professional help and blah 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 so you know so this is a problem you know when people who benefited from this past don't themselves and people at the top do not actually take that first step to be yeah. the one to say something went wrong here and i'm the first one to admit that something went wrong then that opens the door for all others, you know, to do so. Just one last, I know that sometimes there's one thing leads to the other. I want to say this last thing to illustrate as well. Cyril Ramaphosa, for instance, the president, current president of South Africa, this is actually a very important illustration. Mm. He admits, uh, he, he apologizes to the nation because now all the stories of corruption, the extent, the breadth, the depth, the impossible, you know, abyss these men, you know, mm. descended into, the yeah. old, and women who, who were caught up descended into. Now we are discovering what it, it's all been about. So he makes a statement of apology and 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 says the ANC is accountable because all of these people, the road leads back to the ANC yeah. to, of all of these crimes. Jacob Zuma, as of course we would ex expect. He, is, he writes a long letter um, addressed to the president, Sir Ramaphosa, and accuses him, accusing him of um, uh, compromising the position, uh, this is not his language, but of compromising the status and the standing uh, of, the, of, of, of the ANC, that he's the first ever president to find fault in, in public, accuse the, the ANC for being corrupt. No other president in the history of the ANC has ever done this. Now, that is big time, you know, high level denial, exactly the kind of denial we are criticizing FWD CAC for. But now when it happens yeah. to the ANC, you know, within the ANC, we're supposed to turn a, 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 blind, a blind eye, you know, but... Um, mm. Yeah, but I mean, and of, of course, just to quote you, one thing leads to another. Yes. Um, polarization, deeply polarized societies fuel corruption, don't they? Because you don't need to worry about accountability. You can always just keep your side pointing the finger at the other side and there's less accountability. You can get on with your corruption. I like that very much. I like what you say, because this is exactly what is going on, because it's it's, you know, which crime is worse? Yeah. So it's a polarization instead of people thinking about how do we build, how do we, you know, how do we build build an ethical society, you know, it, and it starts with all of these at all levels. It doesn't matter which side of the of the past you are on, but the responsibility to be accountable 
for building, you know, an ethical morality within our our society, particularly in these societies that have a history of conflict. It's it is so important for leaders to be upstanding, but you know, unfortunately, it just it has not happened like that. Just finally, these ideas on uh, the possibility of repair on transgenerational and historical trauma. You're working this up bit by bit to, to a full full blast in print, uh, a, a new book. Um, how far are you into it? I, we just, well, we are, there, there are two processes actually. One process is we're working with colleagues at the university within our research. Uh, now it's gonna be a, a center on historical trauma and transformation. We, uh, we we just did a book. In fact, the, the Mitchell Institute is, is implicated in that book because John is one part of the series that uh, uh, my dear friend and colleague John Brewer is is, uh, is editing. So while we, we've done one book, we looked at other contexts, uh, transgenerational trauma in other contexts. Now we are one of our um, uh, senior researchers is leading the analysis of this process. And so that's going to be the, the project. What I'm working on is is a is is this issue of the 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 reparative humanism? I'm looking at TRC testimonies to look into what did we miss. My project at at Harvard, uh, the fellowship that I, I have at Harvard, is looking at um, looking back at the Truth Commission uh, process right. to, to think about what is it that we missed. So it's almost like a different kind of temporality, you know, that sometimes trauma is about you know, looking back trauma of the past. But what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to look at what was the foretelling. You know, there was the moment of the Truth Commission where people mm-hmm. testified about the pain and how it comes from the past. But how did, as I was saying earlier, how did this extent of the violation that has happened in the country, mm. how does it point us to a future of trauma? So, mm. so looking at the violence, today and trying to rethink the process of the truth commission and to to look forward so to speak now you know um john broad talks about remembering forward so it's, it's an adaptation of that in a way they kind of remember what thinking back in order to remember exactly yeah in the future so um so it's those it's, it's that's what I, that's what the, this project is about and, and and i think i mean one of the things that i'm hoping for is that we use the truth commission we don't use it enough we use the commission as a site for for productive research you know mm. I, I think uh, the, the the institute the mutual institute and, and and my colleague Hastings who's heading up the institute is doing just that you know looking focusing on what is happening in uh, uh, um, your, your country and and the students working on issues related to what's going on there we haven't done that quite in south africa so the hope is that we will be able to this is why i'm really interested in staying connected with the with the mutual institute in order to learn in order for our students to learn mm. what their students are doing so that they can also think about how their own context can be a site for research and for knowledge production this is so important well when you make it out of the archives do come back to belfast sometime would you yeah thank you it'd be <laughs> lovely to see you again Pumla, thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.